Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We're going to get underway. We have a very full agenda this afternoon. We've got uh, uh, three excellent panels for you. Let me start by introducing myself. I'm Jim Musser with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. And I'd like to say a very hearty thank you to our co-host, the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, for putting these panels together today. It is a great pleasure to work with the folks at the committee. And I think that what will be said today will be very valuable for one of the most important discussions that's taking place in the policy world today. We have three panels, and there will be opportunities for you to ask questions. I know uh, a lot of you work on, on Social Security and, and related in retirement and retirement security issues, so we will have plenty of time for you to interact with the scholars. The issue before us today, SSDI reform, is one of the most urgent ones facing us. For many years, someone has played the role of Cassandra and said, the patient's sick, the patient's sick, the patient's sick, and now the patient really is sick, and we're looking at insolvency and a 19% cut in benefits, and obviously that's politically untenable, so something has to be done, and so the question will become, what will be done for this sick patient? Will the patient get a Band-Aid, a transfusion, major surgery, how, how will it be handled? And so we have assembled today some of the very best physicians that can address the illness of this patient, looking first to give us a diagnosis and how did we get here, then looking at the impact of the disease, and then we will not go away without some hope because there is an opportunity to, to do reform and there are some good options that can be put on the table for reform and so we'll hear about those as well. But urgency and opportunity really are the messages to take away today. So I'm going to move right on to our first panel. We are, we are joined by Mr. Stephen Goss. We are very pleased to have the Chief Actuary from the Social Security Administration with us. Uh, Mr. Goss has been with Social Security Administration for many years and has been the Chief Actuary since 2001. He holds a Master's Degree in Mathematics from the University of Virginia and a Degree in Mathematics and Economics from Pennsylvania University, or University of Pennsylvania, excuse me. And he's worked in the area of health insurance and long-term insurance as well as pension and disability and survivor protection. He's a member of the Society of Actuaries and the Social Security Retirement and Disability Income Committee of the Society of Actuaries and a number of other learned academies. He is joined on the panel by Chuck Blahouse, who is a senior fellow at Mercatus. He will be speaking today in his role as a scholar at the Mercatus Center where he's a senior research fellow but Chuck is also one of two public trustees for Social Security and Medicare. Mr. Blahouse is the author of Social Security, The Unfinished Work, and Pension Wise, Confronting Employer Pension, Underfunding, and Sparing Taxpayers the Next Bailout, and a very influential study, The Fiscal Consequences of the Affordable Care Act. Chuck also spent time in the administration uh, of George W. Bush, he was a special assistant to the President for Economic Policy and the Executive Director of the Bipartisan President's Commission to Strengthen Social Security. Chuck holds a PhD in Computational Quantum Chemistry from the University of California at Berkeley, and his BA is from Princeton University. And our final panelist on our first panel today is Mr. Ed Lorenzen, who is a Senior Advisor at the Committee for the Responsible Federal Budget. Prior to joining the committee, Ed served on the staff of the Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, and he's a longtime veteran of Capitol Hill. He's very familiar with the congressional budget process, having served as a policy advisor and legislative director to a fine member from Texas, the Honorable Charlie Stenholm. He was with Mr. Stenholm from 1990 through 2004, and he was a senior policy advisor for House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer from 2007 to June of 2010. Ed holds his BA in Government and International Service from American University, 
And without any further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Mr. Goss. Well, thank you all for being here. And uh, I hope that there is some possibility that we can share something with you that you don't already know. But with this learned group here, this group of friends, I mean, you know, it's great. It's the peril of having been around a long time. You get to know a lot of people, and uh, there are an awful lot of uh, great people in this room. First thing, just a little level set on what the disability insurance program is. Uh, I'm sure everybody is very familiar with There's about 155 million workers uh, actively working or not actively working who are actually insured uh, in the event they become disabled to the uh, uh, level necessary to receive disability insurance benefits. About 9 million uh, individuals in the country today under the age of 66 are actually receiving disabled worker benefits, and about 2 million auxiliary beneficiaries are dependents of them, spouses, children. Many more are protected, uh, obviously, from the potential loss than that 9 million, uh, that whole 155 million uh, people are people who, in effect, are holding an insurance policy should they suffer uh, uh, a medically determinable impairment that renders them unable to engage in substantial gainful activity. The level of benefits, uh, people are familiar with that. Uh, we've estimated these as being uh, somewhere in the vicinity of around 40 to 45 percent of what the person's career average earnings are, and that varies a little bit depending on whether you're a high earner or a low earner, as I think probably all, all are familiar here. Uh, on the next slide, I just wanted to give you sort of a little bit of a perspective on where we've been, what has happened with the cost of this uh, disability insurance program. You can see on the blue line here is what the actual cost as a percentage of gross domestic product has been historically rising up towards about 2010, 2011, and what it's projected to be going forward. Uh, obviously, the percentage has been going up over time uh, for a number of reasons that have been much discussed. Uh, an additional reason that we haven't really talked that much about, actually, is the maturation of the program. Uh, it wasn't until 1960 that people who were under 50 and became disabled under 50 could actually start to receive benefits. A person, for example, in 1959 who became disabled at age 20, they could not come on the rolls. By the next year, they might not have been insured for benefits and couldn't come on. So actually, the maturation of the cost of the program and of the beneficiaries in the program didn't really happen until well into the 2000s. Uh, and you can sort of see the picture here. Lots of other factors going on at the same time, obviously. Women entering the workforce, becoming insured and getting benefits. Uh, but the good news is, basically, we're now at a position where we've sort of topped out at this about 0.8% of gross domestic product for the cost of the program going forward. The problem is that the scheduled revenue for the program is less than the 0.8%. And that's really what uh, we're here about, and that's what the Congress uh, is going to have to face on this. Now, just for a, a level set, there's been a lot of comparison to what other countries are doing. And we found it kind of interesting. The Netherlands is sometimes brought out. The Netherlands, uh, so you know, has benefit levels that are on the order of double what the SSDI system are. Uh, and has a prevalence of receipt of disability in the adult population about half again larger than Social Security. And these are uh, some slides from Rich Burkhauser and Mary Daly that they put out uh, in 2014. You can see the prevalence rate uh, in the adult population is about 4% for Social Security, and it was about 6% for the Netherlands and higher for a number of other countries. So if the benefits are double uh, and the prevalence of disability receipt are about half again larger, that ends up being about three times, which is how much more the Netherlands disability insurance program costs than the U.S. program. Uh, so again, the, 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 the question before our Congress is, where do we go with the disability insurance program? How do we get the cost for scheduled benefits and the revenue under scheduled revenue to be back in alignment? Now, another further thing, just to sort of understand what the cost for Social Security disability insurance is going to be in the future, and also for the rest of Social Security, because it's one big program. Uh, this little graph that uh, I'm sure a number of you have seen in the past is probably kind of useful. The purple line shows you the portion of the adult population, age 25 and older, that is below 65. That's potential disability territory. Above the purple line is the adult population that's potentially in retirement territory, retirement benefits. Well, you can see that uh, the purple line has been moving along. Maybe most important is to look at the distance between the green and the purple lines. Because the green line is for people under 44, disability prevalence isn't very high there. Between 45 and 65, disability prevalence is pretty high. So you can see what happened between 1990 and 2010, the distance between the green and purple lines, the share of our adult working age population that was at the prime disability ages expanded rapidly. So it's no surprise that the cost of Social Security's disability insurance 
relative to payroll, relative to GDP, expanded a lot. But the really good news is, look at what's happening after 2010. Actually, the distance between those two lines is actually uh, shrinking a little bit and then is staying stable thereafter. Why? Because the baby boomers will be moving out over the next 20 years of the prime disability ages. That's the good news. But maybe not quite so good news is where are they going? They're all going over 65. And that's why you see the purple line, which shows you above that is basically the cost of the retirement side of Social Security. That's what's going to be doing the growing in the future. So we're going to move away from growth being on the disability side of the equation over to the retirement side of the equation. That's really sort of what we're facing going forward uh, that policymakers will have to address and um, think about for the cost of Social Security and where we go. Now, a little bit more on the disability insurance program. This is going back to 1995 projections that we made. And you can see in the, uh, uh, in the 1995 trustees report are the blue bars and the red bars are the, are the 2013 trustees report. This shows the percentage of GDP that was the cost of disability insurance. You can see actually the projections back in 1995 were, were pretty close. The only place where really it's turned out to be a higher cost as percentage of GDP was in the year 2010, and I think we all understand that recessions happen, and kind of a big unexpected recession actually happened starting at the end of 2007 and sort of ran up cost. Now, this may look kind of good as though the uh, estimates were all sort of low here. The problem is, though, when there's a big recession, the cost as a percentage of GDP may not go up much, and it doesn't, but the revenue coming in drops a lot when we have that happen. Now, just for a little look at recessions, we many of you have probably seen this graph before. It shows recessions on, on the red line going up and down over time, uh, and it shows what the disability incidence rate is for the Social Security disability. And you can see there's a, a pretty good correspondence between the two. We also have identified on this, you might want to take a look later if these slides will be available to you, at some of the other things that have happened legislatively over time, which give us some ideas about things that could be happening in the future. But again, going back to this recessionary effect, which is really kind of important, especially in terms of where we are right here today, if we look at the most recent recession, the, the, what happened from the 2008 trustees report, a time at which uh, nobody foresaw the recession coming, neither the trustees nor CBO nor OMB and, and the president's budget, everybody was not seeing the recession as yet. For assumptions set late in 2007 that showed up in the 2008 trustees report, CBO budget outlook, uh, and the president's budget. Uh, but you can see what happened between the 2008 and we'll show here the 2013 trustees report about the extra number of, uh, well, not the extra, but the shortfall and the number of workers that we actually had compared to what had been projected in the absence of assuming there was a recession and the shortfall in the number of disability beneficiaries that we have. And you can see the shortfall that we actually ended up experiencing and the number of workers was huge. Uh, the shortfall of, uh, in, or, or, the, or the excess number of beneficiaries we ended up having over and above what was expected in the absence of a, a recession was relatively modest. The next slide actually sort of illustrates for you sort of what the relative share of the change in the cost of DI as a percentage of GDP was as a result of the recession. And it goes through 2010, 11, 12, 13. The blue lines are really the higher level of cost of DI as a percentage of GDP. Uh, and you can see it was by quite a bit. It was like 14%. That's not 14% of GDP. But the cost, if it was 10% of GDP, it went up by 14% or by like 1.4%. So it, uh, it, you can see that the blue lines show you how much more uh, we elevated the cost of DI as a percentage of GDP. But the sort of pink and the darker red lines show you how much of that was attributable to uh, increased uh, DI benefit cost, which is relatively modest, and how much of it was due to just plain a, a drop in the number of workers contributing into the system. There's huge leverage on these trust fund programs from having a recession that gives us fewer workers, fewer people contributing into the system. Another thing that, that we should keep in mind, again, it's hard to be so, you know, sort of hung up on cycles, but, you know, business cycle has been kind of a big deal lately. Uh, and one of the things that's kind of an uh, interesting observation, we put an actual note up a, a while back to talk about what the allowance rates are for people who apply to disability. And there's a very interesting relationship between the allowance rates about two years hence from a change in the unemployment rate. And many have observed that when the unemployment rate goes up, people still want to find a way to feed their family and will have more people filing for retirement benefits and for disability benefits. But as you will not be surprised to see, uh, in the period after we have a surge up because of a big recession in an elevated unemployment rate, 
when more people apply for disability benefits, our allowance rates actually go down. Why? Because we have a very consistently applied method of, of determining whether somebody is disabled. When extra people come and apply for disability benefits in the midst of a recession, these people on the margin tend not to be as uh, readily allowed for disability benefits. And these allowance rates really just sort of illustrate that. Uh, so where are we really with the disability insurance program? You can see for the overall OESDI, the black lines here, our projected track for the uh, disability insurance plus the old age insurance trust funds here expressed as a percentage of the annual cost of the program. A nice way to sort of look at how much our reserves are. You can see our reserves peaked back around 2010 for the program as a whole, peaked back a little before 2005 for the DI program, and they've been following along a trajectory here where we look like we're you know, moving down and something really has to be done. Clearly the DI program, as we're all very well aware, maybe too well aware, uh, is approaching the point where some action has to be taken. Uh, around December of 2016, the trustees are projecting uh, with assumptions that have been put together by the trustees in a, in a large group with a lot of thought uh, that we're going to be going to the end of 2016 for reserve depletion. At this point, actually, that's so close, there's not that much uncertainty left. Give or take a month, that's uh, pretty much what's going to happen unless something miraculous <coughs> happens in the economy between now and then. The OESI fund is in a lot better shape. So what is going to happen uh, as we move forward? Well, uh, so can, can we fix DI by just changes to DI alone? Let me just mention a couple of uh, items here, and I won't run through these because I think the rest of the day is going to be covering these and many, many more options. Time-limited benefits. We did some work for uh, Tom Coburn back uh, a couple of years ago uh, and, and for many others. And some of the things that you've all seen changing the vocational grid ages, uh, the possibility of time-limited benefits, offsetting disability insurance benefits for unemployment insurance compensation. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is that when we have a broader look at fixing Social Security's financial situation, if we increase the retirement age as we did back in 1983, that actually shifts more cost over to the DI program. So that, all, that is something we'll have to address in the overall context. So how do we actually fix the overall OESDI program? Well, as we go forward, obviously something's going to have to be done for DI reallocation of the tax rates somewhat, like in 1994 has been raised. There are other options, but at this point, I think as Chuck and others have well noted and, and the trustees understand, uh, we're kind of like late in the game to make a lot of changes that are really going to have an immediate effect. So something's going to have to be done to either really truncate benefits, which will happen under current law if we do nothing, or to infuse some revenue in on a temporary basis while, while more comprehensive changes are really developed. And basically for OSDI as a whole, we're looking at a point where we've got about 4.6% of GDP as the revenue going on in the future. And the cost is about 6% of GDP for what's scheduled under current law. We're going to have to either reduce benefits by 25% from what is scheduled in law or raise the revenue by a third or some combination of the two. And as uh, historians, I'm sure Ed will probably say, and everybody else here I think understands, past big comprehensive reforms to Social Security have usually had some combination of those two. So we look forward to, to what those will be. Are we out of time here? Okay, we're out of time, so I will not talk about ways to lower cost or ways to increase revenue. These are things that we uh, yeah, should, should, should get at, and hopefully everybody will be on. But I will close with one little slide, which is you can go to our website, sac.gov slash OECT, uh, where we have a, a whole bunch of stuff, lots of facts, lots of information, including even the trustees' reports and lots of analysis related to them. So thanks very much for the opportunity, and I certainly look forward to hearing uh, all the other points that are going to be made by the folks in the room here today. Thanks a lot. We'll turn now to Dr. Chuck Blahouse. Let me first make sure that I've got this working. All right, good. Um, well, like Steve, I have more material to go through than there is uh, time to go through it. So, uh, of necessity, I'm going to very quickly. <coughs> Uh, gloss over a few of these slides and just try to linger only on the points that uh, I really think are, are most important to impart uh, uh, orally in the limited time that I have. Um, the first point that I want to make is simply that, uh, just a little bit about the basics of the disability program and how it relates to the rest of Social Security. Um, there are some ways in which the disability component of Social Security is, is walled off and separate from the rest of Social Security, and there are some ways in which it is integrated. 
Uh, a lot of people, and the trustees are guilty of this too, we, we tend to talk about Social Security, uh, about the entire operations of Social Security when we're talking about what's going on with program finances. But if you get into the technicals of the law, uh, basically, we have two different Social Security trust funds, the Old Age and Survivors Insurance Trust Fund and a Disability Insurance Trust Fund, and they operate separately. Uh, they each uh, have to have a positive balance in them in order to send out benefit checks, and, and basically we are responsible for monitoring the, uh, the adequacy of, of both trust funds independently. And obviously there are other uh, respects in which the disability program is separate as well. You have uh, separate eligibility and awards determinations processes for the disability side uh, with respect to the, uh, in comparison with the retirement side. And of course there's a, a distinct set of policy issues uh, facing disability. There's also some important respects in which the programs overlap. Uh, and one very important one, uh, in which you have to bear in mind if you're talking about reform of any part of Social Security, is that they use the same basic benefit formula. Uh, th and this is done so that there is a seamless and continuous transition when a disabled individual reaches normal retirement age. This is so that there's no discontinuity in the amount of their benefits as they go from one side of Social Security to the other. So, that, so the two sides of Social Security use the same benefit formula, and if you make a change to that benefit formula, and if you don't specify that it's for one side or the other, it's going to affect uh, um, uh, benefits on both sides of Social Security. And, and I should also mention that uh, certainly the demographic and economic factors that uh, have an impact on OASI finances also have similar impacts, although often differently timed, on the disability side of Social Security. Now this is one of those slides that I'm not going to have time to go through in detail, but, but the reason that disability looks the way that it does in relation to the rest of Social Security uh, has to do with the history of its creation. When we first established Social Security, there was no disability component. The disability component of Social Security was added in 1956. It was on a very limited basis. It was only to people over the age of 50. It was later expanded. Uh, and, and there was a very fierce debate uh, at that time about uh, whether to add disability benefits to the Social Security system. And there were people who had very strong feelings on different sides of that question. And ultimately, there was a compromise that was struck. Uh, the, the House had put disability benefits into their Social Security bill that year. The Senate Finance Committee had stripped them out. And ultimately, there was, a, there was a compromise reached where an amendment was adopted on the Senate floor saying we'll establish this disability program, uh, but it's going to have its own separate trust fund, and we're going to prevent it uh, from commingling with the finances of the old age and survivors uh, portions of Social Security. And that was to address concerns that people's retirement benefits or the, or the financing available to fund their retirement benefits, uh, that was not going to be siphoned off in order to pay a disability benefits. Uh, this, in fact, these next two graphs, um, basically are directly from the trustees report and if you are a masochist and you like to read the trustees report uh, you will find that uh, we tend to put a lot of things as a percentage of worker taxable wages so when you see percentages on this graph when you see percentage on the next graph and on my table after that that's how everything is uh, represented and we do that to give a sense of how program operations compare to a typical worker's uh, wages. Basically, their wages subject to the Social Security tax. And so you can look at a graph like this and get a sense of how much of that worker's uh, wage income is being absorbed by the disability program. And the next graph is going to show how much of the Social Security program as a whole is absorbing of that uh, worker's wage income. And, and what you can see here, uh, that bold line uh, basically shows um, program costs. And you can see, as, as Steve noted, this, only gra this graph only goes back to 2000. But you can see that the cost of paying disability benefits were rising uh, substantially faster than the taxable wages of workers. And, uh, and then, of course, as Steve alluded to, uh, there was another surge in uh, cost growth when we hit the, with, when we hit the recession. And uh, since, um, for the last several years, uh, we've been in a position where the cost of paying disability benefits substantially exceeds the disability insurance payroll tax. And when you get into that situation, you can only continue to pay full scheduled benefits by having the general fund of the United States basically redeem bonds that are held by the disability insurance trust fund. Uh, so basically, we're, we're paying part of the benefit directly from payroll taxes, and then we're paying the rest of it by using general funds to redeem debt held by the disability insurance trust fund. And that is drawing down the assets of the disability insurance trust fund. And under our current projections, those reserves are going to run out in uh, late 2016, and from that point onward, we would only have enough revenue to pay 81% of scheduled benefits. And obviously, this is a very 
uh, great concern, uh, especially if you are a disabled individual and, and relying on a, an uninterrupted stream of benefits. Before I go to the next graph, there's one thing I want you to notice uh, from this graph if you haven't already. If you look at that cost curve, you see that it peaks as a share of workers' taxable wages. In fact, it's already peaked and is in the process of starting to come down a little bit. And we don't project that uh, costs on the disability side are going to be growing going forward relative to the tax base. Why is that? Is that because we have magically solved all of our problems with disability uh, insurance cost growth or or the award determinations process. It's, it's not because of that. It's basically largely because the disabled are aging out and starting to age out of the disability side of Social Security and move on to the retirement side. So the, the baby boomers who have been going through their years of peak disability incidents in recent years are in the process of becoming retirees. So while this curve is starting to bend downward in the near term, uh, what's happening is that if you look at Social Security as a whole, the costs of Social Security uh, in the aggregate are continuing to go up through the, uh, the mid-2030s, and that's largely because uh, the baby boomers are in the process of becoming uh, retirees. Um, there was one more point I was going to make about this, but I can't remember what it was, so I'm going to continue onward. Um, oh, no, I, the, the other point was simply that, um, well, I'll, I'll make this on the next graph. Basically, this is not a situation in which the reason disability is facing uh, the more immediate shortfall is simply that we're giving it too small a share of the overall Social Security payroll tax. If you look at the overall financials of Social Security, and again, everything here is expressed as a, workers, uh, uh, as a percentage of a worker's taxable wages, that in, in the long term, we are actually facing the bigger shortfall, both uh, in absolute and relative terms, on the old age and survivor side relative to the disability side. Now, that's not to say we don't have policy issues and imperatives that are unique to the disability insurance system. We absolutely do. Uh, a lot of them are going to be discussed today, uh, especially on the subsequent panels. We have a whole set of issues that we need to deal with on the disability insurance side. Uh, but it's not the only side of Social Security that faces a financing shortfall. And in fact, if you look at all these numbers, the only numbers that actually look worse on the disability insurance side relative to the old age and survivor side are, are that last row, the date of projected reserve uh, depletion. Um, we're showing disability insurance going under in 2016 and the other side of Social Security not until 2034. And again, that is predominantly because the baby boomers hit the disability rolls before they hit the retirement rolls, and so the uh, financial pressures are simply hitting that side of Social Security earlier. Um, another very important point that we make repeatedly in the trustees' reports uh, I'm certain to the annoyance of many in Congress, but we make it nevertheless uh, year after year after year, which is that we are running out of time to deal with this problem. Uh, and this, um, it's always going to be the case that it's going to be difficult to repair the financial outlook for Social Security. But each year that goes by where we don't do that, it gets more and more difficult to solve. And in fact, we are now already so late in the game that if we were to enact a solution to Social Security's financing shortfall, uh, going forward, we would have to make changes to the program that are substantially more severe than the ones that were agreed to in the landmark 1983 reforms, which were themselves very, very difficult to enact. Uh, and if we wait too many years further, it's going to be so much larger than that uh, that one would be justified in being extremely skeptical that we're going to be able to pull that off at all. Uh, we try to put each year various uh, illustrations in the trustees report to, to make this point, uh, showing that um, the magnitude of changes that you have to make in order to repair Social Security finances, while very significant now, just becomes prohibitively severe uh, in a few years to the point where they aren't even options anymore. Uh, and um, this is basically, I would say that you're facing choices that really uh, go along a continuum of responsibility to irresponsibility. If, if, if none of you had to worry about politics, if none of your bosses had to worry about politics, and you just said, what should we do in a substantively perfect ideal world, what would be the most responsible thing to do? It would be comprehensive reform, fixing Social Security finances as soon as possible, involving as many uh, birth cohorts as possible, so you can spread around the changes as equi equitably as possible, and at the soon as possible time. Now, that may not be what is politically most desirable, but substantively that would be the most responsible thing you could do. What would be the worst thing you could do? The worst thing you could do is to make the problem worse. Uh, add costs to the system, uh, make the costs go up by having further delays. Anything that makes the problem more difficult to solve is a very irresponsible thing to do. Where's the realm of the possible? Do as much as you can. Do as much as you can to improve the financing outlook as soon as you can. I, I would note, uh, I put a note at the bottom of this slide, uh, that there's a, there's a rule that says that if you're going to do anything to rearrange revenues uh, between the Social Security trust funds, it should be in the context of legislation 
that improves the financing outlook of Social Security by at least 0.01 percent of taxable payroll. And all I have to say is I would hope we could do at least that well. That is a, a very uh, relaxed and I would hope a very easy hurdle to, uh, to overcome. And if we can't do better than 0.01 percent of taxable payroll, then we may as well go home because Social Security will be in a lot of trouble. Um, the question has been raised as to whether we need to get more revenues into disability insurance in the near term. I think the answer is yes, we do. Uh, we don't have enough time to keep disability insurance uh, from going under the reserves being depleted by 2016 without some type of revenue infusion. Uh, Secretary Liu made that point at our last uh, trustees uh, report, and you can see he said, uh, you know, there's nothing else we can do that will be effective enough, fast enough, in order to uh, hold off the de depletion of the DI trust fund reserves, and we're going to have to have some additional revenues. At the same time, the trustees' reports also make clear, don't make that the only thing you do. You're going to need some additional revenues, but they should be uh, put in there, uh, if at all, on a temporary basis, and basically in the context of a solution that makes overall improvements in the finances of Social Security, and are not simply used as a mechanism for buying time and avoiding uh, more substantive reforms. This is a, a, a picture that has so many words on it, I'm not even going to try to uh, go through it here. Uh, but basically, this is just a little bit of history as to how we got to the, the place where we currently are. And if I had time, uh, I would basically explain that in the past, we've reallocated taxes between OASI and DI several times, but usually in the context of more comprehensive legislation to uh, shore up Social Security finances or with the intention of doing so. And I would hope that would be the same uh, here. Um, now, what to do about DI reform, uh, what you do is you listen to the panels that are going to follow us, and they'll have all the answers. Uh, but, but here, very, very quickly, I'll just say, I personally uh, tend to think of it, uh, the way I think it's helpful to think of it is to say, all right, let, let's look at the things that are driving disability insurance cost growth, and let, let's divide them into different categories. There's a certain number of, of elements that are driving DI cost growth that the program has in common with the retirement side. Demographics, economic factors, the aging of the population, and there you have the same value judgments to make that you have on the old age and survivor side. How much are you going to raise taxes? How much are you going to slow the growth of benefits? Uh, for what proportion of people's lives should they be drawing benefits from that particular part of the program? Uh, there's also another part which has to do with the uh, substantial increase in award rates, uh, even adjusting for sex, even adjusting for insured status, uh, over the last several decades. And, and there we have a set of value judgments to make. Do we want that? Do we want award rates to be at their current levels? Do we want them to be something uh, lower. If we want them to be at their current levels, then we're going to have to raise taxes pretty substantially to pay for those uh, be because we do not have enough revenues coming into DI. Uh, if we don't want to raise taxes to that extent, we're going to have to uh, slow the, uh, uh, the award rate growth that we've experienced over the last few decades. Uh, and with that, I would just uh, reiterate what I said at the beginning of my talk, which is that we are facing a, a substantial financing shortfall in DI and a threat of imminent reserve depletion. Uh, that threatens uh, a sudden reduction in benefits for disability beneficiaries. Uh, it is a shortfall that is more immediate than it is on the old age and survivors insurance side, uh, but it's not actually any more severe than it is. Uh, Social Security as a whole faces a financing shortfall that is just as severe as the one uh, particularly within DI. And the sooner we deal with the problems on the DI side and with Social Security as a whole, the better off the program will be. Thank you. Always intimidating to go after, speak after Steve and, and Chuck on a panel like this. I don't know that I'll have much to add. In fact, they made many points. And um, I will be uh, actually violating a, a cardinal rule for budget wonks and, and social security wonks of actually making a presentation without a PowerPoint, which I will be sanctioned. Um, perhaps the, the sanctions will, will go into the social security disability trust fund and help improve the, the balance. But um, we'll just go over some briefly to talk about the, sort of the legislative history of the of DI finances and how we. We got here um, and some of the lessons to draw from that. Um, as Chuck mentioned, the uh, DI uh, program was added to the Social Security Act in 1956. At that point, uh, there was a, a payroll tax of 0.5%, 0.25 on the employer and employee side uh, that was dedicated to DI. And so the, the total uh, OS uh, DI contribution rate uh, increased from 4% to 4.5% um, with that additional 0.5 dedicated DI. Since then, the total uh, payroll tax rate um, and the, the, DI, uh, the total uh, tax rate for DI has increased six times. Um, twice it was done through uh, increases in the DI tax rate alone, um, along with an increase in uh, overall OSDA taxes. Three times it was part of an increase um, 
so twice it was done where we just increased the DI tax alone. Three times it was done where we increased the overall OASDI taxes with the DI getting, uh, with a reallocation, giving a greater share of that increased taxes to, to DI. Uh, so the DI rate went, went up. And then twice through a reallocation that increased the uh, share of taxes to DI well, that kept OASI constant. Um, so currently, the, the uh, payroll tax dedicated to DI is 1.8% of the 12.4% tax. Um, so we've talked a lot, a lot about uh, Congress has done reallocation in the past. Congress has enacted uh, reallocation legislation, legislation reallocating taxes six times. We'll hear the number uh, that there's been 11 reallocations. That's because several times the legislation, Congress passed legislation that did reallocation in different stages. Um, for example, in 1980, it was a temporary reallocation in which the, the share of taxes that went to OASI increased um, for a year and then uh, subsequently was scheduled to decrease. And so the 1980 Act scheduled a couple uh, reallocations. Similarly, the 1994 reallocation had it occur in a couple stages. Um, so it was six pieces of legislation. Congress acted six times, um, and that, but those reallocations moved it in different directions. Um, I'll just go briefly over the, the history of the reallocations that uh, the first two reallocations in 1967 and, uh, and 1969 were part of legislation increasing uh, benefits. And in those uh, instances, uh, the old age program actually had an actuarial surplus. Um, and so the uh, increased benefits could be largely financed by the surplus. The DI program did not have enough money to pay for the increased benefits. And so uh, Revenues were reallocated from OASI to DI to cover the increased cost of benefits in, in the DI side. Um, 1977, Congress enacted a major Social Security reform that was intended to uh, improve Social Security solvency, um, and and that within the context of that reallocation, it shifted some money uh, temporarily, increased money to DI, uh, and then brought it back down. In 1980, Congress passed a a temporary reallocation that. Uh, shifted some money from DI to old age, but only on a temporary basis, followed by borrowing authority. Um, and that led directly, as I'll mention uh, briefly, that led directly to the 1983 reforms, that the temporary borrow, the uh, reallocation and temporary borrowing in 1980 bought enough time uh, to do 1983 reforms. And then in 1994, Congress enacted uh, a reallocation from the old age program to the DI tr uh, trust fund. Um, so the, the reallocations fall into three basic categories. The first two were part of legislation increasing benefits when the overall program had a surplus, um, but reallocation covered the DI side. In 77 and 83, they were part of comprehensive reform um, that reduced the, the comp overall sh shortfalls. And then in 1980 and 1994, we had relatively clean reallocations. Um, but there were some differences in those two reallocations and, uh, that, are, that are relevant. Um, in 1980, the uh, old age trust fund was facing depletion of its reserves as early as 1981, so it was facing an imminent crisis, and the DI uh, program trust fund was actually uh, in surplus and was projected to continue to grow for the next 75 years. Um, so this, there, there was a much stronger shape, um, it, but it had only temporarily reallocated uh, revenues for two years, and it was also enacted shortly after Congress had enacted uh, reforms to the DI program, which improved DI trust fund solvency. Um, and it was intended to try to put the two trust funds on an equal footing. Uh, the 1994 reallocation was necessitated because the DI costs and en en enrollment grew faster than was projected after the 1983 reforms. And so the, uh, in the early, uh, early 90s, the trustees started noticing that the DI trust fund was, was growing faster than had been projected um, and was facing a shortfall. So the reallocation effectively corrected for the fact that in 1983, we shifted money from DI to old age. Um, and 94 essentially sort of corrected for that and brought revenues, uh, the share of revenues from DI and OS, OSI in line with their share of costs. That reallocation was designed to meet the test of short-term adequacy, which, meant, which means having trust fund assets to cover 100% of benefits uh, over the 10-year window. So it's not surprising that a reallocation that in 94 that was intended to put the trust fund in uh, short-term balance uh, would have us facing problems uh, shortly 20 years later. Um, but in 1994, we were the OASI trust fund was depleted, projected to be depleted in 40 years. By contrast, it's uh, 20 years. 
And the shortfall in the 90s was, was unexpected and uh, due to factors that weren't entirely understood. And so the reallocation was also intended in part to try to understand what was going on. Um, but the current depletion of the trust fund has been expected for a long time, and we, we understand the factors, so it's a very different situation. And then uh, significantly, uh, prior to the 1994 reallocation, the actual shortfall in DI was four times larger than OASI uh, in relative terms. Um, and as Chuck mentioned today, the OASI trust fund actually faces a, a slightly larger shortfall in relative terms. Um, so the difference is um, reallocation has generally diverted revenues from the program with a surplus or smaller actuarial deficit to the one with a larger deficit. That is not the case today, where OASI faces a larger shortfall. And prior reallocations generally rebalance payroll taxes to align with the relative cost, and so the percentage of uh, payroll taxes going into each program was roughly proportional to the, their cost. Today, those two, they're roughly in line, and actually DI's share of revenues is slightly higher than its share of cost. So it's not that we're putting too much money, uh, not putting enough money into DI, it's that the, the overall program faces shortfalls. Um, one of the other lessons we've learned from past reallocations is that a clean reallocation uh, tends to delay action until a crisis happens. And the two clean air reallocations are instructive. In 1980, it was a temporary reallocation with borrowing, and that led to the 83 reforms because we, the temporary reallocation only bought a couple of years. In 1994, the reallocation was much larger uh, and bought many more years, and as a result, we haven't acted for 20 years. And so uh, when we think about what to do on reallocation, realizing that whatever we do in reallocation is going to delay uh, uh, real action. Um, so that's why we think uh, that depletion of the DI trust fund should be an impetus for comprehensive reform. Um, unlike the past reallocations, both programs face roughly the, the uh, comparable long-term deficits, so we should be addressing both of those, um, and as we did in 77 and 83. And the DI trust fund exhaustion should be viewed as a warning about the old age program. As you saw from this, the chart that Steve had, that the uh, DI program costs went up when uh, the baby boom generation was in their 40s and 50s, and we're now, as we're moving past that, the number of people in their 40s and 50s is declining, relative, but more people in their 60s and 70s. So it's not surprising that a program facing pro that largely serves people in their 40s and 50s is depleted 20 years earlier than a program that serves people in their 60s and 70s. So we really should look at the DI Trust Fund as the warning buoy of the tidal wave of the baby generation hitting the old age program. And then finally, comprehensive reform just provides many more options uh, for reform in that the programs are interrelated and linked and then if you were trying to deal with a DI shortfall entirely on the DI side, it becomes very difficult to find savings to do so. Comprehensive reform um, provides many more options. But absent comprehensive reform, we think that we should uh, do reallocation for a limited period of time to keep the pressure on to address the underlying shortfalls and avoid continued delay. Um, and ideally, include, have it accompanied by modest changes improving overall solvency, even by a, a modest amount, as the House rule requires. But also improvements to the DI program that will serve the people with disabilities better um, and test options for, for reform. And if we're doing a short-term reform, a reallocation that a couple of years, we have time to talk about reforms and then facilitate further action um, on comprehensive reform following that. Thank you. Thank you. I particularly uh, appreciated the historical aspect of it, and, and it prompts, before I uh, open the floor for questions, it prompts a question for you, Chuck. Uh, what was the involvement of the trustees in that 94 reallocation? Uh, did they play a role in that? Did they anticipate that that was going to, to happen and, and kind of keep happening? Um, well, they did. It's actually, it's, it's interesting because one of the things I do as a trustee is I study how uh, trustees have handled issues in, in the past, uh, which certainly establishes uh, a precedent that's, that's relevant to my thinking, although you know, not necessarily always dispositive. But um, what happened in 94 was basically this. There, was, there, was, um, there were the 83 amendments, landmark amendments, uh, and then after the 83 amendments to restore Social Security solvency, there was subsequent legislation on disability in 84, uh, which liberalized the eligibility criteria for disability somewhat. Uh, and that, uh, in addition to some other factors, caused disability costs to rise pretty dramatically. So by the early 90s, costs on the disability side were about 40 percent higher than they were projected to be at the time of the 83 reforms. And part of that was also a, there was a recession, and, and they didn't really have their a handle on all the factors yet. Uh, but, but disability was going south in a hurry. 
and uh, the, the trustees um, considered what to do about this. And the, the two public trustees basically decided to sort of recuse themselves from the, um, the, the proposal development of the ex officio trustees. So the, the two trustees at the time were uh, Stan Ross and David Walker. And they said, we don't think it would be appropriate for us to participate in the development of a trustee proposal coming basically from mostly administration officials. But, but what they did instead is they said, the administration officials will develop a proposal and we'll decide whether we agree with it or not, or whether we're going to endorse this or, or not. And they decided to endorse it. They said, we, we agree with it. And, and they appeared before uh, uh, Congress and, and testified basically in favor of a two-step process. They said, reallocate taxes in the near term um, we can't fully explain to you all the reasons why disability costs are growing, but we do think comprehensive reform of the DI side is necessary. We just can't tell you yet how it should look. So they said, do the reallocation now to, to meet our short-term solvency test, which is a 10-year test, and that'll buy you enough time to enact the comprehensive disability insurance reforms. Now, I, I think it's safe to say the one thing that they did not anticipate happening was that we would go 20 years without ever enacting those reforms. Then we'd be against the wall again, and then we'd just reallocate the taxes again. They, in fact, the, the trustees put out language at that time saying, don't do this again. They, put, they did a letter to Congress saying, don't just reallocate taxes further. Uh, make sure you get these uh, reforms in place. But for various reasons, the reforms never happened. Now we're up against the, uh, the wall again. Um, uh, but basically, the, the public trustees did sort of endorse a, a two-step proposal in, in 93 and later in 94. Uh, to reallocate taxes in the near term and, and pass comprehensive reforms later on. And if I could just add to that, I spent some time looking in, as a, a person with a congressional background, wanted to look at the legislative history of the 94 reallocation and what Congress was saying at the time. And the legislative history about the reallocation is remarkably sparse. That all Congress said was, both in the, in the committee report and floor debate, was we're doing the reallocation that was recommended by the trustees. Um, and basically didn't provide any further justification. But actually, the 94 reallocation was done. Uh, it was the domestic employment tax that people may remember, the nanny tax issue that affected uh, cabinet nominees in the early 90s. And so most of the, the legislative debate on legislation was about the nanny tax provision, which was very modest. And there was, I said, almost no mention that the manager of the bill just said, we have the reallocation recommended by the trustees. Now let me talk about the rest of the bill. Um, so that means, <laughs> that makes the, what the trustees said at the time very, very important, because that really was the only place we had a justification. So as Chuck said, the trustees said, when they made the rec reallocation, that there shouldn't be a further reallocation, that that would jeopardize the program, and emphasized both before the reallocation occurred and after it occurred, that it needed to be followed by comprehensive reform. Um, and since they said it was really remarkable, it was the trustees uh, de developed it and Congress just adopted what the Congress recommended, that those, those warnings of the trustees really should be uh, very telling and sort of guiding your view of the 94 reallocation. I'm sorry, but can I just make one additional point there? Because Ed just reminded me of it. That the, the trustees, when they weighed in on this, um, they wrote some very um, uh, vivid language in the trustees' summaries and the, and the reports, and especially in the message of the public trustees, talking about the importance of getting comprehensive reform of disability and why it had to happen. Uh, but not only did they do this before the tax reallocation, they even came back and did it after the tax reallocation. So the, the reallocation was passed in 94. And then in 95, the public trustees came back again and said, even though you just reallocated the taxes, that is not doing everything we told you to do. Um, this, this was just, uh, we view this as just buying time to enact the comprehensive DI reforms that we recommend. Mr. Gossain, you know you need to jump in here, too. Just, just to sort of add, I'm, the role of the trustees historically has been uh, actually what's required in the law is that they speak to the actual status of the programs and say when it looks like we're we're flush with cash or when we're not so flush with cash and when things have to happen. Historically, the trustees have really not come in and, and laid out specifics. Uh, I think Chuck, Chuck nailed it exactly in 1994. It was really the ex officio trustees and not the public trustees that came out and really explicitly made a statement about the reallocation. There's only one time I can really think of where there was really sort of an exception to this and it wasn't really specifically a proposal. Back before the 1977 Social Security Amendments when we had basically an out of whack uh, benefit formula, the trustees actually included in the report something called the modified theoretical approach, which is basically what ended up later getting adopted. They put forth a different way to do the benefit formula, but that's really been the exception of the rule. The trustees have been, have stayed very close to the notion of just the actual status of the program, 
and that's the rest of the people in this room that are responsible for getting their bosses to go and actually come up with the changes. And I think we'll have to leave it there for this panel, and thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>